the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Quarantine 2 Terminal, released in 2011 to limited theaters, but really direct to DVD. And only DVD, not Blu-ray, which is why the movie footage isn't high def. Although the first Quarantine was nearly a shot-for-shot -shot remake of the Spanish film Rec, Quarantine 2 is not a remake of Rec 2, nor is it a remake of any other movie, nor is it a found footage film like its predecessor. Like the skeleton guys flanking Mr. Pumpkins, it's its own thing. That's normally something to get excited about. And honestly, Quarantine 2 does have a few other things going for it that made me want to like it. For instance, its setting. It takes place mostly in the unseen areas of an airport, which I think is a great location to be in while you're running away from foamy-mouthed killers. I also like how they've continued the story of the first movie, with the Super Raimis now being weaponized as a sort of WMD. Unfortunately, the acting and dialogue make Quarantine 2 seem like something made for cable TV. It's painfully plain, and every character is an empty shell who's only given a single attribute to make them sympathetic. Whether that's being pregnant, or on their way to see a long-suffering spouse, or being the father of a toddler back home. None of these tear-jerking characteristics save them from messy deaths, though. And I've got a sponsor for today's episode, so I can show you all the carnage unedited. Manscaped gives you everything you need to keep your downstairs looking like a finished basement. And when you're done using their Perfect Package Essentials Kit to clean things up, you can slip on a pair of their boxer briefs, which will keep everything temperature controlled with their crop cooling technology. I love wearing this anti-chafing underwear while I'm working out, because I only want the best for my boys. You can get the best for your boys, too, for 20% off by going to manscaped.com slash deadmeat. That's manscaped.com slash deadmeat for 20% off and free shipping, so you can get those boxer briefs today. Let's see how many people escape their uncomfortable coach seats through death and get to the kills. The movie begins on a runway at the most frustrating place in the world. LAX, baby! Super Besties flight attendants, Jenny and Paula, are getting dropped off at this hellhole so they can work a small flight headed to Kansas City. The plane will be flown by Captain Forrest and co-pilot Wilsey, who's feeling a little woozy there. I think I got it for my dog. Oh, you think it's woofing syndrome? Bummer. By the way, Wilsey's actor, Andrew Benator, was just seen on the kill count as the very first victim in Stranger Things, the scientist who got killed in the elevator. And for those of you asking, the season two kill counts will be out in October. The nice thing about Quarantine 2 is that it's got a finite number of victims for me to count. They're mostly limited to the passengers on this plane. Let's dead meet them. There's a prickly adolescent in a blue hoodie named George who's placed under the supervision of Jenny. Look, I can take care of myself. Fine, God. A doctor named Kingston who suffers from Parkinson's and is traveling with his wife, Bev. Doc can hear you, he just can't speak or move very well. A gambler named Ralph Bunt who doesn't have a great understanding of personal space, a medic named Shyla, who's on her way to see her husband for the first time in over a year, and a kindergarten teacher named Henry traveling with a cage full of his class's hamsters. Bitey, bitey hamsters who look like rats. There's also a high-maintenance pregnant couple named Niall and Susan, a horny European couple, Havorst and Nika, an impatient guy named Preston, who, uh, what's he doing there? Oh, I see. Business! And a woman named Louise, who has the cutest little kitty! Also, Louise's actor Sandra Ellis Lafferty was previously on the kill count in a small role as a nurse in Wes Craven's New Nightmare. And that's the extent of the behind-the-scenes tidbits I have for this movie. Sorry folks, there's just not a lot of info out there for this direct-to-DVD endeavor. After Jenny's done flirting with Henry and putting his hamster rats below deck, the plane's ready for takeoff for the 12 passengers and 4 crew members. Man, this is always the most boring part of flying. Glad I'm watching a movie where we can just skip over it. Oh, what? This movie's gonna show us all of the pre-flight procedures? Just make us sit here and watch this boring shit? Great. I honestly don't know what I find funnier. The inclusion of all that bullshit, or the fact that some obviously improvised dialogue was messed up when they kept it in anyway. I'm going 
be nice. I'm going to be a daddy. <laughs> like, the guy starts his line, the two of them talk over each other, and then she laughs politely as he restarts his line. I'm, I'm going to be nice. I'm <laughs> going to be a daddy. Plus, just his weird delivery there. <laughs> I'm going to be a daddy. <laughs> I love it. That daddy-to-be is disruptive on a phone he shouldn't even be using right now. So Henry intervenes to help Jenny out. He's not a fan of how people behave nowadays. Does it make you wonder about the human race? Oh, we're going to make it? No, not really, bro. For some reason, Jenny's into this dude, hanging around him as he watches news coverage of the first movie on his laptop. But she can't spend the whole flight flirting, because she's got other passengers to tend to, like Ralph. I just need some water. Yeah, he needs to replace the blood he lost from that rodent bite. I'm sure it's just dehydration. Jenny checks on Ralph a little bit later, and finds him foamy and icky, and pukey and sicky. She and Paula try to clean him up, not noticing that cute kitty getting a little cheap meal in, but Jenny's barely even done with her mid-flight makeover when Ralph charges at her full speed down the aisle. He bangs on the cockpit door, yelling that he wants off the plane, until a few passengers, including little guy Georgie, get involved and try to subdue him. Together, they get Ralph to the ground and bind him, while inside the very cramped cockpit, Captain Forrest reports the situation to the FAA. They ask him if the passenger has rabies-like symptoms, which, uh, yep, so they demand that the plane make an immediate emergency landing, which does not look like a fun time. Fuck that. The attendants try to strap Ralph into a chair, but some turbulence knocks Paula down into his biting range. Bad news, since Ralph is now fully infected and can go on the ca Oh, he bit her face! That's no good. Once again, the passengers band together against the big guy and succeed in shoving him into the bathroom right as the plane touches down. At least Paula had a mask- What? He did that through a mask? God damn! Shyla sedates Paula and tries to bandage her wound as the rowdy rabies man growls and groans from the bathroom. When the airport refuses to give their plane a gate, Captain Forrest decides to take one for himself. So he pulls into a terminal worked by a guy named Ed Ramirez, whose shift was just about to end. Tough break, dude. The passengers leave the plane as the pilots keep Ralph in the bathroom, but they find the door to the terminal closed and locked. With Paula needing serious medical help, Ed leads them on another path through the bowels of the airport. Where are we? Ramp up staging area, where all this shit gets done that you'll never see. Like I said in the intro, I like seeing the inner workings of an airport in a horror movie. It's a good location, nice and spooky. But it doesn't lead them to any escape, because every door and gate they try is locked. You got us on lockdown. Lockdown. What? Yeah, you ever heard of terrorism? <laughs> Little thing called 9-11? Ever heard of it? Idiots. The news of the concept of terrorism freaks everyone out, and their fears aren't quelled when they realize there's a friggin' army setting up outside, with a megaphone voice telling them what movie they're in. Part 2 Terminal, motherfuckers! The passengers get unruly and begin to take it out on Jenny, but medic Shyla shuts them up by saying Paula needs to get fixed fast. She says she has a med kit in the plane hall that can help, so Ed agrees to take Jenny and a few others back to the plane. On their way there, the power goes out, giving us more genre-appropriate lighting as they reach the plane and find that nobody's there! Ooh. I do like the police lights in this shop, the way they're dancing up and down the aisles like that. Kinda cool. They look around for any signs of life. Nope, none in the bathroom. And an unreasonable amount of time goes by before they realize that Doc Kingston is still sitting in his seat. What? Where the fuck did his wife go? And how did they not see him sitting there this whole time? Preston agrees to watch over the Doc as the others climb through a hatch into the hall. Jenny finds Shyla's med kit as Niall retrieves a handgun he checked, and then a loose white lab rat shows up and scares everyone into a tizzy. Fucking Huh, wonder if that thing came from the cage full of supposed hamsters, Henry? Jenny climbs out of the hall and looks around for someone else that I can add to the kill count. <gasps> and she found one! It's Wilsey, who's clearly infected. His head cold in the beginning was just a red herring, but now he's been for reals infected by Ralph. Okay, bye Wilsey. And hello, Captain Forrest. Guess she couldn't see the forest for the rabies. The infected pilot attacks Jenny, and then Ed, until Niall shoots some bullets into, and thankfully not through, his back. The survivors run back to the boarding bridge, where they find Doc and Preston on the ground. But Preston's got a bite mark on his neck, so yeah, maybe just leave that guy there. Jenny also finds Beth. Oh, so that's where the Doc's wife went. 
and that's where she goes on the kill count since she's infected. Though, you couldn't necessarily tell from her total lack of makeup. Come on, Quarantine 2, these cheap roars just ain't cutting it. They get back to the others and catch them up on the whole rabies thing. Shyla helps Paula with a patch up as Jenny talks to this 12 year old about her character art, which is learning to take control of situations. Super cool! To further herself along that development, Jenny makes a big speech to the others about how she's in charge now, no matter what Niall says. I got this. So shoot me or shut the fuck up! With everyone deliberating, nobody notices that Doc Kingston is worried about a rat he sees overhead. Oh, and now it's on his head. Oh, and it bit him. Get out of here, rat! They capture the rat and decide to stick Doc behind some chains for their own safety. Aw, it looks like Paula got put in plain jail too. The rat is an albino lab rat, just like the one in the plane hall. And the only one with any idea of how they got there is George, who says he saw tails sticking out of Henry's carrier. I had hamsters when I was little. They have little stubby things that you can barely see, not tails. During an aside, Henry promises Jenny that he didn't bring rats onto the plane, okay? He's a good guy, he swears. They hug out her suspicions of him until big man Ralph reappears, all infected and growly. The other passengers come to the rescue, and together they end up hanging Ralph until he dies. But of course, since I counted him when he got infected, there's nothing more to add right now. They get a visit from the CDC, who are here because they're looking to adopt a new pet. Oh, thinking about a rat? Good call. They're low maintenance and smart. The passengers ask them why they're all pointing guns at their faces, but are told to just keep their asses calm for the time being. Everything will be explained. They take Niall's gun and free the infected passengers from their jail. Now, why y'all doing that? Everything will be explained. Alrighty then. They stick the sickies with needles full of drugs, but nobody else is eager to volunteer for the treatment despite the constant reassurance of future understanding. Everything will be explained. Explain it to us now! Louise finally agrees to give the shot a shot, but her kitty bites her and runs away. It's a bad pussy! Just like what Bron needed. Doc Kingston is also revealed to be infected, as he's now up and about, with strength enough to bite this CDC worker's neck out. They shoot Doc down and kick their way out of the building, and the four CDC guys are followed by the tie-dye-wearing Havorts, one half of the vaguely European horny couple. He leaves his girlfriend Nika behind, but maybe that's for the best, since he and the CDC workers are gunned down outside. One of them survives though, which is why I'm only adding four people to the count right now. With the sounds of the infected hordes getting closer, everyone runs to a catering truck so they can hide in the back. Niall hesitates though, cause he's not feeling too great. In fact, he's infected, which is confirmed when he pulls his wife Susan away. Henry takes the gun and demands some answers from the CDC guy. It's not CDC. CBDT. Whoa, you guys brought CBD? Nice. Chemical biological domestic terrorism. Oh, never mind. That's pretty narky, dog. He confirms this outbreak is connected to the Los Angeles penthouse lab from the first movie, which was owned by someone from a doomsday cult who created the virus in the first place. Since they never found an antidote and things are looking pretty grim, the CDC worker grabs the gun and takes his own life, shooting himself off screen. At least that truck has a drain, though. That's convenient. The drain reminds Ed of a service tunnel beneath this terminal, which they can find with some maps just over the- Oh, Willsy! What up, Dal? To stop Willsy from being killsy, George hits a button that raises the truck and crushes the zombie co-pilot into stillness. They leave this truck of delight and head out to find a map of the terminal, though Henry suspiciously disappears along the way. Nika also suspiciously disappears. Not sure which infected person got her, but it might have been Paula, who Jenny sees has finally succumbed to the virus. Took you long enough, Paula. Most people turn in like half that time. It's like you don't even care. Jenny takes some leadership and defends the others against her best friend, knocking Paula down a couple of stories where she dies with that patented fake looking leg angle. People always do that when they fall to death in movies. They get to an office and look for the blueprints as little Georgie Porgy goes through Henry's backpack that he yoinked. In it, he finds printouts of plans for world domination. Henry's a goddamn bioterrorist, part of the doomsday cult that made this virus. And in fact, it was his penthouse apartment in the first movie. 
And you know what? I bet he's not even a real kindergarten teacher either. Ed locates and reads off the blueprints until they're rudely interrupted by a power drill. Oh, wait, what? That's Susan? Confirmed infected? Sounded more like a power drill to me. But no, it's Susan and Niall, who attack the others, sounding like drills and or cats. <laughs> Henry appears and shoots them, and though it looks like he's been bit, he's not all that concerned. Because as George reveals, Henry had an antidote in his back, developed at his apartment in LA. He says his mission is to save the planet through population control. I told you before on the plane I'm one of the good guys, willing to do something and take responsibility for the future. But Ed don't buy that shit, so he charges at Henry and catches a bullet in the side for his effort. Henry does some crowd control and then gives himself a shot. Oh, right in the eye. Nah, man, not the eye. Fuck, you can just feel that pressure. Oh, amazing. <sighs> I can't feel a thing. Bullshit. He takes the blueprint and the blue boy and pieces out on the ladies, planning to escape and turn Georgie into a little eco-terrorist in training. For absolutely no discernible reason, Jenny and Shyla split up. So Jenny's by herself when Preston charges at her, the first time we've seen him fully infected. He chases her through this human-sized mousetrap obstacle, but she ends the zany action with a crazy contraption, because Preston forgot the most important rule. Don't get caught. Jenny then comes across the infected Nika, who starts, uh, sniffing into the air. What, you think you smell someone who's not infected, Nika? Maybe check behind you. Well, I mean, you could have just turned around, but okay. Jenny escapes Nika's detection and reunites with Shyla, who grabbed a pair of goggles from the CDC guy. Wait, are they heavy? If they're heavy, then they're expensive. Put them back. Instead, she gives them to Jenny, because somehow she's been bitten, and she'd rather go out buying Jenny some time to get away. Jenny watches through the goggles as Shyla acts as bait and draws out a bunch of infected people, including Louise, who's just, well, the virus hasn't made her any faster, huh? By the way, counting Shyla here as she's attacked because we never see her infected. And I mean, you know, she fucked. Jenny escapes through a hole in the wall and follows a trail of blood on the floor with her goggles. She sees that it goes around a corner and, oh, okay, now she's uh, crawling through the walls or some shit. Cool. A couple of carefully placed clues lead her straight to George, who's huddled in a hole and saying that the antidote didn't work on Henry. Jenny comes down to help George, despite his urgent wishes for her not to. Jenny, please don't. Please go back up. Please, please. But she does it anyway and finds Henry super infected and ready to be all scary towards her. Yo, where'd your shirt go, dude? He growls and bites at her as George puts on the goggles and grabs the gap. With a rat-a-tat-tat, he puts the bastard down. Mostly, anyway. He's still wriggling and writhing a bit there. I wish more characters would learn to double tap their- <laughs> Oh, holy shit! Yeah, there you go, Jen Jen! Glad I got that sponsor. An explosion goes off, cause they be burning this place down. So Jenny kicks open a chute that'll lead them to freedom. Yeah, I can't go in there! No, come on, come on, we gotta go! No way! Yo, what the fuck, kid? Did you not just see that fireball? Get in the goddamn air duct! The two of them begin making the long crawl, but during one of the many times George slows his ass down to look back, he notices that Jenny's starting to breathe a bit more raggedly. Cause that girl's been B.I.T. bit. Leave me. I'm not going without you. Dog, you probably fucking should though. They continue onward, George's face somehow looking super poopy pants, even underneath those goggles. And eventually he reaches the end, where he's able to squeeze himself out like he's toothpaste in a blue hoodie. Jenny's right behind him, but she's infected now. So she attacks George and reveals that she's hated his blue hoodie all along. You look like you were wearing a Snuggie, George. With Jenny stuck behind the bars, George leaves her and walks into a very weird and fake looking shot to end the movie. Through his discarded goggles, we see that Louise's infected kitty has made it out as well. Out into the city of sin, right on the goddamn strip. How many people contracted terminal rabies in quarantine too? Let's find out and take off to the numbers. 20 people died slash were infected in quarantine two, with the victims consisting of seven women and 13 men, a nearly two to one ratio of dudes. 
With a runtime of 86 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 4.3 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Henry if we count the ultimate end to his infected form. Definitely the most impressive kill in this otherwise mostly tame movie. Dol Machete for lamest kill will go to Havorst and the CDC people gunned down outside. Couldn't even see that shit. And that's it. Quarantine 2 Terminal came out in 2011 and is an entirely forgettable sequel. Next week, we'll be getting depraved with House of a Thousand Corpses. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Jesse Spitzer, Matthew Charlin, Justin and Haley Mattis, Samantha Block, Junior Guerra, Nate P, and Sammy Marcelino. Yep, you heard right. We got the Firefly Trilogy coming up next. That means House of a Thousand Corpses. That means Devil's Rejects. That means Three from Hell. Thanks, everyone. Be good people.